Good morning, everyone. <coughs> so how's the connection this morning? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Did you have any problems getting on Zoom? For some reason, I uh, struggled this morning for a few minutes. It, uh, the Zoom site was not letting me in. No? Everybody? You guys didn't have any problem? Okay. All right, so um, we, uh, we, we start in chapter eight. So we talked about uh, some major classes of um, biological molecules. So we talked about proteins and we learned that the main component of proteins are amino acids, right? So amino acids compose proteins. Then we talked about, what else? Carbohydrates, right? So we talked about monosaccharides, which you, when, when you put them together, you get polysaccharides, right? So glucose. When you polymerize glucose, you can make things like glycogen or starch. So these are polys these are carbohydrates. And so today we're going to talk about the third main compo main um, type of biological molecules. So those are uh, nucleic acids. So we will learn that the main component of nucleic acids are nucleotides. So the um, homework on sapling is open, so you can start it at any time. And I guess we have four lectures on this subject and then a test, right? So the <clears throat> lecture, right? So we have a lecture today, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, and then next Friday we have a test. So the, the Friday before the Halloween. Okay, so as usual, please ask me questions. And I will start by sharing my screen. Start by sharing my screen. And we will jump to chapter eight. So, nucleotides and nucleic acids. So we'll learn about biological function, right? So we, um, most of you already know, right? Many different functions of nucleic acids, but we'll review that. And then we'll uh, look at the structures of common nucleotides. And based on that, then we're gonna use these common nucleotides and put them together to understand how double-stranded DNA um, to understand the structure and corresponding to the function of double-stranded DNA. Uh, we'll talk about ribonucleic acids, right? So this is DNA, this is RNA. And um, we'll talk about denaturation, just like with proteins, right? So if you have uh, two strands together, you can denature DNA, for example, right? So you can separate the two strands. And it's a very important process, not only um, in the lab. Uh, you would think that, uh, that uh, when genetic code is read by the genetic machinery, you have to separate the DNA strands sep uh, to, um, so that the genetic material can be read and new and DNA can be replicated, for example or new proteins can be synthesized. And we'll talk about some of the chemistry of nucleic acids. Okay, and what happens if you mutate nucleic acids, if you um, introduce mutations into genes. All right. So, <clears throat> so nucleic acids are polymers of nucleotides. And so the primary molecule that uh, everybody in this world knows, DNA, 
right? So everybody, even those who don't, who are not so um, uh, well versed in scientific terms, terminology, they will know what DNA means, right? So deoxyribonucleic acid responsible for genetic information. And so the primary role of DNA is storage of genetic information. Well, uh, storage is a sort of, it's an understatement, right? So uh, to be able to store something, that means you have to access it easily, right? So storage and organization. So in other words, if you store specific genes, right? you have to be able to access them. So for example, so we talked about uh, irreversible enzyme inhibitors, right? So irreversible enzyme inhibitors are molecules that covalently inactivate enzymes. And so how do you restore the original function. So the only way to restore the original function would be to resynthesize these enzymes, right? And then you have to access DNA. You have to access DNA. And so DNA, uh, there must be kind of some kind of machinery. So, so it's not just storage. It's also the availability of these genes to make proteins. Also, um, obviously, when a cell divides, you have to be able to split DNA into two parts, right? So the two daughter cells have to in, um, inherit the original uh, cop gene copies, right? So the storage, again, it has to be flexible. You have to be able to uh, sp split that into two. So storage is, um, it sounds very simple, but it's actually a very complex process highly organized and highly regulated. So uh, then uh, transmission of genetic information into messenger RNA. So now, um, so now we talk about ribonucleic acids. So we'll learn about the main difference between deoxynucleic acid, ribonucleic acids and ribonucleic acids. So obviously the difference is one hydroxyl group on the ribose and we will see that when we look at the structures. So messenger RNA will be synthesized based on the, gen on the uh, genetic information encoded in the DNA, right? So here we have again machinery, which will allow us to, to convert DNA into RNA with the same sequence of uh, nucleotides, only um, slightly structurally different. Then uh, processing of genetic information. So um, <clears throat> as many of you know, um, the genes are um, in the DNA, they are uh, when they're, when they're um, converted into messenger RNA, there are There are regions known as introns, sorry, introns. introns and exons. So you know that um, RNA, when it's uh, first synthesized, it has to undergo what's a process known as splicing. Splicing. And uh, so the, uh, 
Now, who remembers? Uh, so the uh, so when you have genes, right? So um, which ones actually encode the ge uh, genetic information? The introns or exons? Which one need to be? Which ones need to be removed? Exons code, introns are removed. So introns have to be removed. So RNA splicing. Uh, so uh, so here um, the interesting thing is that the RNA by itself serves the as an as an as enzymes, right? So RNA uh, catalyzes its own uh, splicing process. So introns would have to be removed, right? And the exons would have to be joined together, as we were just told. Exons would have to be joined together. And uh, so uh, this is an important process, again, in the um, transmission of the genetic information, right? And synthesis of proteins. So um, again, the um, it's not, so again, the, uh, the nucleic um, nucleic acids again not just simple storage not just simple processing uh, everything has to be highly regulated and highly organized and you can see here is that we haven't talked about this in great detail but uh, but RNA is actually not can can serve as as an enzyme and can perform the function quite well so um, and once you have the mature RNA, mature messenger RNA, after it's been spliced, right? Then you know it goes to the ribosomes, right? And here there are two other kinds of RNA. So there are three kinds of RNA. There is messenger RNA, there is transfer RNA, and there's ribosomal RNA, right? So the ribosomal RNA is basically um, uh, our, Ribosomes are places where these proteins are synthesized, right? And transfer RNA will bring amino acids to the site of the synthesis. Messenger RNA will bring the sequence of the co of the um, amino acids, which will be then read by the ribosome, and the protein chain will be synthesized. All right. So uh, one type of DNA and three types of RNA. So, so important to remember these functions. Now, uh, also, so these are nucleic acids. These are nucleic acids, but the nucleotides themselves, so again, nucleotides are components of nucleic acids, right? They're by themselves, they have other functions in the cell. For example, one of the main one is the form of ATP, adenosine tri uh, triphosphate. Right, so um, uh, for so this is the main molecule of energy currency in the cell, right? So ATP. So for example, when you when you burn nutrients, right? When you burn nutrients, what happens? You synthesize ATP. Remember the main molecule of or the main process of N of energy extraction from food is adenosine diphosphate, ADP. We'll take one inorganic phosphate, right? Uh, will require some energy. from nutrients and you get ATP. ATP. So we'll look at the structure of adenosine triphosphate as well. So as we will see the nucleotide is the main uh, structural basis of ATP. Then enzyme cofactors, NAD plus, so nicotine, adenine, dinucleotide. So these kind of molecules are enzyme cofactors. So they participate, for example, in the redox processes, right? So for example, um, 
when you have a NAD in a hydride form, you can reduce biological molecules, right? So for example, uh, some kind of uh, metabolite can be reduced and you get the you get the NAD plus. Professor? Yes. Can you repeat what you said enzyme cofactors do? So enzyme cofactors, remember, so these are not part, these are not the, um, so these are part of the enzymes, but they're not composed of the amino acids. So they are not peptides themselves. They're a non-peptide, um, components of enzymes, which enzymes utilize to perform their function. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. And so we get the NAD plus. Right, so so this is the main um, NAD plus and NADH are the main two molecules for the redox reactions in in the cell, and uh, so there's a, a lot of nucleotides which participate in signal transduction. So for example, uh, cyclic adenosine monophosphate. So we'll look at the structure of that as well. CMP is a, one of the key molecules which. Um, uh, can go from, uh, which can undergo um, cyclic phosphate formation and in this form it can bind to various enzymes and uh, activate them or deactivate them. All right, so these are functions. Any questions? So we have uh, functions on the level of nucleic acids and we'll have functions on the level of nucleotides. All right, so uh, uh, let's uh, look at the nucleotides and nucleosides now. So here is gonna be the main structure of a, um, so overall this is a nucleotide. So what do nucleotides, uh, what do they have? So first of all, they will have a, um, nitrogenous base. So there are two kinds of nitrogenous bases. Uh, I mean, there are, sorry, there are, well, there are two main structural types. There is pyrimidine, right? And there's purine, pyrimidine and purine. So pyrimidine, so basically uh, looks like benzene so the only difference is in, in benzene, you have uh, all six will be carbons. In pyrimidine, two of these carbons will be converted into nitrogen, nitrogens. So um, the name of this heterocycle, so it's referred to as a heterocycles. So these are heterocycles. So remember heterocycles are rings in which some of the carbons are replaced by heteroatoms. So do you, can you, remember, can you uh, remind me some of the heterocycles we already saw, let's say in the previous lecture, sorry, in previous uh, chapter, when we talked about uh, carbohydrates? Remember some of the heterocycles we... Um, Puran. Puran, and uh, there was another one. Pyran. Pyran, that's right. So remember furanose and, and pyranose, right? Remember the, um, the two ring forms of sugars, of carbohydrates are based on those heterocycles. And so here we see more examples of such heterocycles. So this is pyrimidine and this will be purine. So purine, uh, the difference is, so in the purine, you still preserve the original six membered two nitrogen cycle of pyrimidine, 
but you add a little, you add another ring to it, which is composed of nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, right? So basically it's sort of, uh, do you remember uh, the name of this ring by itself? So if the one on the left is pyrimidine, what's the one on the right? Remember, so if this was by itself, what kind of heterocycle would this be? And what kind of amino acid is this present in? Just to, just to make some connections. Remember, the best way to remember things is to attach them to something that you already know, right? And not, and not learn the new information from scratch. It's easy to just... Amino acid, histidine? Histidine, right. And remember heterocycle, which, is, which histidine is based on? Well, the name of that will be uh, imidazole. I don't know if you um, remember that from that material. Imidazole. So imidazole is a five-member train with two nitrogens. So, so purine is a combination of pyrimidine and imidazole fused at these two positions. Now, uh, numbering is important. Right, so numbering was invented, invented, uh, and then everybody agreed to that. And numbering is important because uh, every time you talk about uh, DNA or RNA, when you talk about the structure of, of nitrogen as bases, you have to always indicate which position on a base a particular chemist type of chemistry occurs. So in pyrimidine, uh, basically you start on one of the nitrogens. And then you uh, you start numbering towards the second nitrogen, right? Because if you go this way, this nitrogen is will be N3. If you go this way, the nitrogen will be N5. So you will go left to keep the number small, right? So one, the first nitrogen is number one, the second nitrogen is number three, and then you complete the numbering of the atoms in the ring. So this is pyrimidine. Now for the um, purine, the uh, numbering starts on the nitrogen, um, which is, so there are two nitrogens. One is immediately, basically is actually immediately fused to the imidazole ring and the other, one, the other one is away from it. So you start numbering on the nitrogen, which is away from it and then go towards the other nitrogen. So one, two, three, complete the numbering on the pyrimidine ring, and then start numbering on the imidazole ring. Seven, eight, nine. Are these numbering in priority, kind of like we learned in organic chemistry maybe? Is that what this kind of basing it off of? Hmm. Well, for pyrimidine, uh, definitely yes. Um, so it's just explained, you start with the nitrogen, which is remember nitrogen gets high priority because it has high atomic number, right? But uh, here, um, it's a little more complex because um, And the answer to your question would be partially, perhaps. So again, you will start, you start with the nitrogen, right? You don't start with the carbon, which makes sense. And you go towards the second nitrogen, which will allow for the number to be small, right? And then you complete with the second ring. Now, whether why it is, why we start with this nitrogen and not that nitrogen, that I cannot tell you. I think it's just convention. And I don't know if there is any specific, um, if there's any specific rule for that. Maybe it's, it's possibly that it's something, this is something for, for us to, to actually, we can look this up historically, how, how the um, nucleotides were numbered. Maybe um, we can both do that. 
you can do that, I can do that, and we can compare what we find on Canvas. But positions are very important. And uh, so what's important to uh, know is that, so these will be linked to the ribose, which is the next unit of nucleotides. So pyrimidine will be linked through, through nitrogen one and purine will be linked through nitrogen nine, nitrogen nine. And um, so, um, so, so these are called bases. Now it's not immediately clear why this would be bases, but uh, for example, Remember, uh, these could be um, don't these don't necessarily have to be Bronsted bases, could be Lewis bases. And for example, on the purine, you have lone pair of electrons, right? So it's a base. So remember, Lewis base, Lewis acid, Lewis base. So Lewis base will be a species with a lone pair of electrons. So so in purine, for example, there's a lone pair here. There's a lone pair there. And the pyrimidine, there is a lone pair there, right? So these are bases, and in fact, uh, they behave as bases. So DNA, in general, one thing to um, really know about DNA, about its chemistry, its chemistry can be summarized with one word, DNA or RNA. DNA is nucleophilic write this down dna is nucleophilic which means it can uh, react with electrophiles so so electrophilic molecules can introduce dna damage right so for example this nitrogen position n7 right is a highly nucleophilic nitrogen and it can participate in many different types of SN2 reactions. So let's say if you have um, X as the leaving group, so this nitrogen can attack it and undergo an SN2 process. SN2 reaction. And so this is one main type, one main, one of the main uh, ways uh, to um, damage DNA. Uh, so this process is known as DNA alkylation. DNA alkylation where DNA serves as a nucleophilic species and it reacts with electrophilic species. And uh, uh, you can actually modify DNA and obviously once you modify the DNA, the genetic code will be misread. The genetic code will be misread and the proteins that will be synthesized will have mutations in them, right? And you can, uh, for example, uh, if, it's, if your protein, let's say it's a kinase, which uh, can be overactive, right? It can never be shut down, can never be shut down. And you can have a mutation that causes cancer with mutation that causes cancer through the reaction of the nitrogen on position seven on a purine with some kind of electrophilic agent, which is a um, DNA alkylating agent. So such compounds are also, also commonly referred to as mutagens. Mutagen. Mutagen. also referred to as carcinogenic agents, right? So in the lab, for example, many agents are carcinogenic, not just in the lab, also in, um, in real life, right? And means they, um, they can cause cancer through modification of DNA. All right, so uh, go back to the structure of nucleotides. So we have a purine or pyrimidine base, right? And that will be linked to position one of a pentose. So this pentose is ribose, 
So what's, what's shown here right now is a ribose. So it's a five member sugar. And or can be uh, deoxy, two prime deoxy ribose. Now, as far as numbering, so if these are just regular numbers, the numbering on the sugar are uh, through the prime system. So one prime, two prime, three prime, just to tell this apart from the numbering on the, on the basis, right? So when somebody says uh, two prime position of a nucleotide, you know that it's on a ribose. If somebody says uh, position two on a nucleotide, you know it's position two on a pyrimidine or the purine, depending on what nucleotide that is. Just hold on a second, guys. Okay. So, um, so then we have the ribose. Now, uh, look how it's linked to the uh, ribose. It's linked through the anomeric position. So if this base is basically, it's a nitrogen, it's gonna be nitrogen, right? I told you, it's gonna be N1 of pyrimidine or N9 of purine. And so it's gonna be linked through nitrogen. And so you have a, so carbon one prime of ribose has a, <clears throat> a bond towards oxygen and a bond towards nitrogen. So this is anomeric. Anomeric. Now, is this alpha or beta? Who can tell me? Is it beta? And what makes you think it's beta? Uh, it's cis. It's cis. And it's cis to um, relative to what? Uh, the phosphate group. Right. So it's cis relative to uh, carbon five, right? So uh, five prime. So it is beta, yes. And um, um, So uh, this position C1 prime is actually also another position where the DNA and RNA can be vulnerable, right? So for example, um, uh, DNA can decompose through the departure of the nucleic base, okay? And uh, um, because remember, numeric positions are can be quite reactive, right? Once the nucleic base leaves, you get a positive charge on this carbon, which will be stabilized by the lone pair on the oxygen. Uh, Dr. Cornico, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, is it beta because it's cis to four prime or five prime? Four prime, right? Well, four prime is in. Um, I mean, it's cis to the four, four prime, five prime bond. Is that, what okay. you, is, that, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, uh, and the last component of the nucleotide will be the phosphate, right? So phosphate, so remember the, uh, which uh, makes the nucleotide negatively charged. Remember that the phosph uh, phosphate in general, the PKA of uh, phosphate is about zero. So, um, PKA of this molecule, let's say this is already negatively charged. And let's say this one is still has an OH. So the pKa of this molecule is about zero, which means that at the physiological pH of seven, uh, all of this will be deprotonated, right? So just think about pH seven, right? pH seven. versus pKa of zero, we're talking about seven units on the pKa scale. 
right? Seven units is um, is what um, ten million, ten million. So which means that for one molecule of um, protonated phosphate, you're going to have ten million molecules of deprotonated phosphate, right? And so the phosphate will be deprotonated, and it's safe to say that all DNA and RNA and all nucleotides under physiological conditions will carry negative charges. Okay. So, uh, so that's the nucleotide. The difference between nucleotide and nucleoside is simple. Nucleoside will be the molecule without the phosphate. So just the, bus, just the base and just the, uh, just the ribose. So that will be nucleoside. Okay, any questions about the nucleotides and nucleosides? I think we've uh, discussed this in quite detail. Hopefully this was all clear. All right, so yeah, for phosphate group negatively charged, um, typically attached to five prime positions. And so nucleic acids are typically built. So when you, when you synthesize these, uh, you actually use a, a triphosphate version of the nucleotides. So in other words, when you have the ribose, so let's say this is your nitrogenous base, I'm just going to abbreviate it like this. So if this is the new uh, the nucleotide, right? So nucleoside triphosphate will be nucleoside, and you add three phosphate groups. Okay, so one, two, three. And so the way uh, the way nucleic acids are synthesized is by um, the removal of this terminal diphosphate, also known as a pyrophosphate. Pyrophosphate leaves, and you have a um, single phosphate left. And so this pyrophosphate is actually a great leaving group. And why is it a great leaving group? So let's draw the structure. Let's draw a structure. Remember the leaving group, the strength of the leaving group is determined by the stability. Right? So if this is the diphosphate, like so. Um, so the highly stable and why is it highly stable? Because it's not very basic. Remember I told you the, um, PKA of these things is close to zero, right? Which means that they're not very basic. If it's not very basic, it's stable and it's a good living group. Good living group. Remember in organic chemistry, we abbreviated living group as LG. Good living group. And so, um, So adenosine triphosphate, guanosine triphosphate, um, thymidine triphosphate, and cytosine triphosphate, sorry, cytidine triphosphate. Um, there are all these, uh, there's all this terminology we're gonna learn. I sometimes get confused with that as well. There is, um, actually on the next couple of slides, we will see the different uh, terminology used based on if it's uh, part of a nucleoside, part of a nucleotide, or part of the just the um, of the base, nitrogenous base without the ribose. So, um, so two or three of these phosphates used for building nucleic acid leaving group and completed contain one phosphate. So this will be one phosphate, which is going to be part of nucleic acids. All right, so that's the phosphate group. And so you can see on the nucleotides, so the phosphate can be attached to different positions. Uh, the two main, two, the two important ones are obviously 
the one that is attached to five prime, right? So this one, five prime position and three prime position, position. So these positions are going to be important in, when we build the nucleic acids and the, um, the phosphate on, there will be two ends, there'll be five prime end, there'll be three prime end, and the phosphate will originate from three prime end or five prime end, depending on which direction you're going. So this is adenosine five prime monophosphate, adenosine three prime monophosphate, and this is the cyclic one I was telling you about. So this is the molecule which is important for signal transduction. So adenosine two prime, three prime, cyclic monophosphate. Now this one, uh, two prime monophosphate, um, this one could be important for uh, other functions or functions of mono of nucleotides. It's not so important in the nucleic acids, okay? But it's important in the functions of nucleotides by themselves, just like the cyclic monophosphate. All right, so uh, for the ribose, remember, so here is the structure of the ribose. If we draw the Fisher projection of the ribose, start with the aldehyde on top, CH2H on the bottom, then all three of the, of the chiral centers, the OH will be on the right. And if we draw this in a cyclic form, um, this will be two, this will be down. And we talked about the, the uh, four prime, five prime bond is on top, going, going upwards, and the OH will be on top. All right, so uh, there are different Packard conformations of the sugar in the possible. Now, the way we draw this, uh, keep this in mind that um, there's a lot of um, steric steric repulsion, right? So for example, when you have OH here and OH there, uh, they eclipse each other. Remember eclipsing interactions from organic chemistry, right? So molecules try to avoid eclipsing interactions. And so when you put this in a ring, the rings adopt different types of conformation other than planar. So remember for cyclohexane, you will have chairs, Chair conformation, one uh, the most stable one, right? Again, uh, to avoid both the angle strain and torsional strain. So torsional strain is the eclipsing interactions. And the same is true for the furanose. When you have a five member train, right? So the molecules try to, the, molecule, the ring tries to escape this planar conformation to avoid the torsional ones, torsional strain. And so what happens is you can see here, there is a ring pucker. So if this is the uh, ribose, right? So this is the oxygen of the ribose, position one prime with the base attached to it. And um, so what happens here is um, you can see a carbon two prime um, can basically alternate between C2 prime exo and C2 prime endo. So endo in organic chemistry by definition, endo, um, you probably remember from Diels-Alder reaction from OCHEM2. So endo, same side, same side. So exo, opposite sides. opposite sides. So, um, so here the C2 prime carbon, uh, you can see it's going up, right? In this direction, which is the same as the C4, C5 prime bond, 
So they both end, so basically they own the same side. That's why it's a C2 prime endo conformation. And if the carbon two prime goes up like this, so a ring becomes non-planar, but what this allows, what this allows want, what this allows the ring to do is to move this base away from the ring. So instead of sticking straight up like that, right? So the base can uh, actually move away from away from the ring and avoid a lot of these uh, torsional strain. So avoids avoids uh, let's just call it steric strain. Steric strain. Now the same uh, can be achieved by um, uh, actually by manipulating with the C C3 carbon, right? So again, if this goes up like this, then I, again, it's on the same side as a C5 prime, but it allows for the ring, allows for the ba nitrogenous base uh, do the same thing. So instead of sticking straight up, it goes like this. Okay, and also allows one to avoid the steric strain. So, so ribose, even though we draw this in a planar form, like though, right? Uh, always keep in, keep in mind that this is non-planar. Non-planar. It's just for convenience. We draw this as a planar five-member ring. Uh, Dr. Cornego, so we talked about a six-member ring being a chair. Would this be an envelope? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So envelope. That's right. So sometimes so that, these puckers. So sometimes these pucker um, conformations are referred as envelope conformations. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And then, so do the same rules apply that we talk about chairs that we want the larger groups equatorial as well? Um, well, here the equatorial doesn't really equatorial axial um, nomenclature doesn't really apply to the five member rings. Okay. Uh, I think it's just sufficient to say that um, you can just say that uh, the nitrogenous base is um, is pointed away from the the other groups in the ring. You can just explain it like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So. All right. And the, well, let's see. And let's, the last thing, let's look at the nitrogenous basis. Nitrogenous basis. So these are again derivatives, pyrimidine or purine. Nitrogen containing heteromagic molecules, planar. So, uh, so planar. So, obviously, these ones now, it, when they're part of DNA and RNA, we will see that they're almost planar. Whereas in the heterocyclic form, they are planar because they're aromatic, right? Remember, anything that's aromatic um, will be planar. So, here's our numbering. We talked about that. They also absorb UV light because they're now anything that's aromatic will absorb UV light in the um, in this, about this region, right? So because these are highly conjugated pi systems. And so there are five of these um, bases. Now, um, so, um, uh, so the two of them are purine, three uh, pyrimidine. So uh, we'll look at the structures, but cytosine, adenine, and guanine. So these are found in both DNA and RNA. Thymine, only DNA, and uracil, only RNA. Now, both uh, H-bond donors and acceptors. And so these are neutral molecules at pH 7. But remember, they're basic because of the lone pairs. And so here's something that for you to, unfortunately, have to memorize. There are not so many of them. There are only four, only five. 
So here's the purine, purines, adenine and guanine. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, to tell you the truth, because I don't work with um, DNA and RNA in my research, every time I teach this class, I kind of have to go over the structures myself because it, I teach these, this class maybe every once, once in two or three years. So in two or three years, I keep forgetting these structures myself. Well, not entirely, but I do have to look at the structures again to, um, to be confident when I draw them. So, uh, so here's adenine and guanine. So these are two purine bases, two purine bases and three pyrimidine bases. So cytosine component of both DNA and RNA and thymine and uracil. So thymine is uh, DNA and uracil. So, uh, so these are easy to remember in a way sort of um, uracil, uh, basically just pyrimidine with two carbonyl groups. You start with uracil, then you add the methyl group and you get the thymine. So from, so uracil and, thym and thymine components of RNA and DNA, these are easy to remember. Then cytosine and, and guanine could be also easy to remember because they're kind of the inverse of each other. There's carbonyl and amino group, right? And in the cytosine, there's carbonyl and amino group, they kind of switch the positions, right? Look, amino group down, carbonyl up, carbonyl down, amino group up. So cytosine and, and guanine, they switch their positions. And what's important, uh, this uh, guanine and cytosine, not only they switch their positions, anybody knows what's another, what another importance is between guanine and cytosine? Guanine's bisect and cytosine's only one echo. Yeah, but uh, what's is there any other connection between guanine and cytosine? They bind through triple uh, through double bonds or triple bonds. Yes, so they are complementary bases. That's right. So when we talk about the double stranded DNA, uh, G uh, forms hydrogen bonds with C, right? Guanine with cytosine, and so and that's exactly how they do that through the the amino group and the carbonyl on one side because this is a hydrogen bond donor. This is hydrogen bond acceptor, right? And this is the other way around. This is hydrogen bond acceptor, this is hydrogen bond donor, and this is hydrogen bond acceptor, and this is hydrogen bond donor. So, uh, so all three of these parts are complementary. So G forms hydrogen bonds with C. And so it's one, so I'm just giving you some, some uh, different tricks how to remember the structures, different pointers. Adenine, for example, uh, you will find that adenine and thymine, they form the um, complementary uh, AT bonds, right? And you can see here at this position, there is no hydrogen bond acceptor or donor. So adenine, remember, remember A and T will form two hydrogen bonds and there are only two positions where this can happen, right? So this is hydrogen bond donor, and this is hydrogen bond acceptor, and there is nothing here. That is why adenine is only capable of two bonds. Anyway, so we'll, uh, when we talk about double-stranded DNA, I'll bring this up again for you. So some easy tricks to remember these, um, uh, these structures. Okay, any questions about uh, today's lecture? All right, so hopefully um, you learned something about nucleotides and uh, we will uh, slowly transition to nucleic acids on Friday. All right, well, have a good uh, couple of days and I'll talk to you on Friday. And there was something, what was it? Um, we were gonna investigate something about uh, the numbering, numbering. right? Numbering, okay. Let's do that. So put something in the canvas. Bye, guys. Thank you.